halfway point of Save Your Photos Month. Thousands of people have taken the pledge, important initiative, and we wanted to let you know if you haven't joined up or you haven't found an event, there's still time to join us all and get involved in this important event to save photos. So go ahead to saveyourphotos.org and, and join us. And before we start, there's two more quick things. Starting this month here at Easy Photo Scan, we have invested in new technologies to help you you more. So basically, we have new technologies that are going to give us personalized ways to get in touch to really help you out with any sort of technical issues or support issues you might have. Also, I want you to mark your calendar for October 11th. We all what about the workflow? I have the great scanner. I have everything I need tools-wise, hardware-wise. What about the workflow? We have you covered there as well. We are going to have four tips that are going to help you with that workflow as long as well as a panel of experts to help you with that that you can ask questions to live and get the answers you might need to help you in your workflow with your photo projects. Without further ado then, I'm going to introduce you to Rick Lippert. He's the owner of EZ Photo Scan. And he also happens to be an expert in a lot of this stuff. I go to him for all the questions I have. So without further ado, here's Rick. Rick, are you there? Hey, James. Thanks so much. Welcome, everybody, to our webinar this afternoon. We're really excited about offering this webinar. It's going to give you an insight to our own toolbox and let you peer out behind the, the curtain and see the types of things that we actually use. I just want to make sure that uh, we are starting the recording because we will record this session as well so that if you uh, want to come back to it as a reference, it will be available. All right, so started. Ten tools that you don't want to start scanning photos without. Uh, I am and I own Easy Photo. Doing this now for about five years. Uh, we came from the document imagement uh, and we scanned hundreds of millions of pieces of paper and we started scanning photos and we just simply love it. The way to unlock this power and the stories behind all those pictures is so much fun. So we welcome you to this edition of our webinar series. So I'm just going to make an assumption at this point that you join this webinar for the reason that you understand that scanning printed photos is a really good way to unleash that power of all those magical moments and all those stories and the memories that they represent. And that way you can keep them and protect them, share them, and connect with them with all these uh, tools that are available. But we are asked a lot of times, OK, I got a scanner, and I'm good to go. What other tools do I need to have? And that's what we're going to address today. So this is one of our work areas. Uh, to your left of the screen is uh, Troy Underwood, who works with us. And then David is on the right, and they're busy doing what they should be doing every day, and that's And one of the things that you'll see here is David's got a scanner in the hand corner, and he's also got a flatbed scanner right adjacent to it. But there are tools all over the place. And in fact, you know, if you're into gadgets, widgets, and whiz bangs, you, photo scanning is just a heaven for you because there's all sorts of tools. And we'll get back to all these tools in just a minute. But I want to kind of go with this statement that Winston Churchill said. So if you give us tools, we'll finish the job. Well, Winston was probably right, but you have to have the right tools because having the right tools makes all the difference. So what we have done here at Easy Photos here so we have taken the tools and we've broken them up and look at the, our tools from various stages of the process of digitizing your photos. So there's the prep end of it, and that's the physical, where you're actually touching things and dealing with them. The scanning, we are talking about moving them through a digitization process or your scanner, and then the processing afterwards. So those are the three areas, and each one of them have their own tools. And we'll take them backwards. We're not going to talk about this, and here's one of the reasons why for processing tools. 
According to Digital Image Reporter, just this year, there are over 78,000 different applications and tools on the market today that you can use to process photos. Now, I will tell you that that's a lot of tools, and that's a whole nother seminar and a half. But another thing about it is these are growing so rapidly that in just the last two years, it has more than doubled. So that's the processing tools. We think about more of a, uh, things that will enhance the images and, and do types of things with them after they've been digital. What about the scanning tools? Well, certainly here at Easy Photo Scan, we work with scanning tools, uh, primarily with the Kodak Picture Saver scanning system that integrates both the flatbed and a high-quality, high-speed photo scanner. You may have a different kind of tool to digitize, but that's okay. You have scanning tools, and each one of those has their own characteristics. We're not going to talk about those in this webinar. We're going to talk about all the kinds of other things that you need in your photo scanning toolbox that will help you to do your job effectively, efficiently, and the right way. So one of the things that we do here is we sat down and made a decision that we would try to define all the tools in our toolbox. Because as you saw in the picture, there can be a lot of different things. And so we take a look at each one of our tools in our toolbox by, number one, looking at a category. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Then we classify these tools. And it helps us to kind of better understand where they fit in the grand scheme of their functionality. Then we'll describe the tool. Now, I'm not talking about what it does. That's the one below, how it's used. I'm talking about just its physical dimensions, some sort of descriptor, some sort of, of uh, identifier to make sure, because if you have two or three of the same type of thing, that you know that you're pulling the right kind of tool out of the toolbox at the right time. We touched about how it's used here just a moment ago, and that's kind of a definition. And we try to, as a team, decide collectively that this is, in this situation, this is It's a cognitive decision. We also look at where we can buy these tools. We've always got our eyes out for new tools and gadgets that we think might help, so we're always looking for where to buy. And then we're always cognizant and aware of pricing and how much these tools cost. Some of them are really inexpensive, and some of them are quite expensive depending upon the quality that you decide to, to uh, purchase. So what about these categories of photo scanning tools? We put them into two categories, and there's really a third one, and I'll share with you, but, um, well, anyways, I'll get to that in a moment. The first category is the essential ones. Those are the ones that are absolutely necessary or what we would consider indispensable. They'd be in our go kit. They'd be the ones that we definitely have to have. If they're missing or they're not in the box, somebody's going, hey, where's this? It's supposed to be in this box. They're really essential. The other classification or category of photo scanning tools that we've put together is the significant ones. And they're important. These are things that you might need to do for a specialty job or something that comes up that you wouldn't do all the time or you wouldn't have it every time. But it's significant because of its function in helping you do your job effectively. Now, I told you there's a third one. And I'm not embarrassed to tell you, but it's the tools that you wondered what in the world you were thinking of when you bought them. They're basically anchors that are sitting there going, I don't know why I bought this thing. And we've got a few of those, too. Um, and I didn't think they were worth mentioning in this presentation, because we only get you the right tools. So how do we classify our tools? We classify them into three different ways. The first is involving handling. Now, when I talk about handling, what I'm talking about is the kinds of tools that actually 
touch the photos, grasp the photos, and remember your hands are tools as well. Things that will carry or trans photos when they're scanning, and I'm not talking about the actual scanner itself, I'm talking about the photos and something that you might need to use to assist it to transport it through your scanner. Those are all the handling classifications. From an environmental standpoint, we're always fighting dust and particulate matter. No matter where you are, that can be the enemy for you. And so we're looking to find tools in this category that help to influence like the sum total of all the surrounding things to minimize any types of dust and minimize particulate matter and improve our conditions so that it influences in a very positive way our photo scanning. And finally, there's these support tools. And the support tools are things that are used to sustain the process. They're necessary. They're not part of the actual scanner itself, and they're not part of the um, actual digitization process, but they're things that help you to support your role. Now, just as a rule of thumb, and you'll see this in a few minutes, this is divided up into about a 40, 40, 20% um, split. And, and that's kind of about how our tools always seem to work. It may be different for you, but we certainly kind of look at it is that for most of the tools we use, they'll be involved with handling environmental because those tools are tools that we're going to need to help get that physical process of prepping the photos out and ready to go. And then the support tools are things that you make more of an investment to help you do your workflow a little better. So where do you find these things? Well, we find them all over the place. Um, arts and art stores, I love to go to art stores and walk through. You'll find a lot of craft and hobby stores as well. And you can find that online as well as your local retailers. Uh, photo stores, your retail and online photo stores have all sorts of tools as well. Many of the types of tools that you would find for environmental tools to help keep dust and particulate matter away are going to be the same kinds of things that you would use with a camera. So that's where the similarity is. And then there's all sorts of specialty outlets. And um, we'll talk about one of those in just a moment. I found one in a kitchen equipment outlet that is fantastic that we use all the time. There's, of course, the online tools, sources for Amazon. Gaylord has a whole section for preservation. University Products has a terrific listing of them. And, of course, there's Walmart.com. So that's a great way to start looking for your tool sources. So we ran into a problem. We started this presentation, and we said the top 10 tools. I started going around through our toolbox, and we realized very quickly uh, what Mae West meant when she said, too much of a good thing can be wonderful. We just didn't have 10 tools. We had a bunch more tools. So I deviated just a little bit, and I took the presentation to a different level. And we're going to share with you not only our top 10, and we'll look at those in, in a lot of detail, but we're also going to bring up our significant tools and those that we would consider honorably mentioning, things that are important. You don't necessarily have to have it to do your job, but boy, it sure makes it a lot easier, and they're great to have in that toolbox. So if you're ready, I'm ready. We're going to kind of go through these, and I'll remind you that this is being recorded. So if you want to just kind of sit back and enjoy this, please let us know. Take notes if there's something in your toolbox that we don't have. We'd love to hear about it, and there'll be a chance in a few minutes to ask questions and maybe mention some things that we possibly overlooked. So here's our honorable mention group for the handling classification. These are tools that are great to have around, and you'll notice in uh, there's 15 of these honorable mention items. And the first one is photo mending tape. Uh, we use a tape called uh, Filmoplast. It's a fantastic tool. It comes in a roll. I bought it a couple years ago. I, I'll, I'll never probably ever use the whole thing. 
Um, it runs 20 to 30 bucks for the roll, um, and it helps you if you run into tool into a, a photograph or a picture or something that you need to just make absolutely sure that it has uh, the proper uh, mending to it before you handle it. Because if you handle something that's torn, you'll wind up in a situation that maybe you can cause more damage as you're trying to digitize it and preserve it. Another tool that we use is a removable scotch tape. Now, don't settle for the scotch tape that is um, removable, or the, the tape that's removable from something other than 3M. This one, it's, a, it, it's no acid, the acidity, the pH is, is at a neutral base, and it even has, if you could look on the screen there, it says it's photo safe. Um, it has a backing to it and then a light adhesive that will peel off, and if you don't apply a lot of pressure to it, it's perfect for holding things in place. We'll use this if we're using our flatbed and a lot of different areas where we need to just tack something down very quickly, it comes off easily. And so that's one of the tools that we use in that area. Another kind of tool in that same vein is a scanning carrier. If you've never used a scanning carrier, they're a protective sheet that can actually, they were originally developed for copying and faxing, where you could take um, odd size objects and put them through the carrier. So that tool as well, they can be reused over and over again, but be careful when you reuse those that eventually you might see some scratches from the handling of them and putting them away. So take some care as you put them away and they'll last you a long time. And finally, in our honorable mention for handling classifications, we have dental tape. And it's not because we don't brush our teeth here, but dental tape has a great characteristic to it, especially if you get the broad type of dental tape that you can use it as a lifting tool. You can slide it up underneath things. You can use it to help separate things or tie things together if you want to, if you're bundling stuff and just kind of handling it, you need to put them in the stacks. So there's a lot of different uses for dental tape. It's really inexpensive. And you usually get like 100 yards in a, in a roll, and they'll last you a long, long time. Moving on to the environmental classification, this is one that's trying to control primarily dust. And particulate matter. actually will not only filter the air, but also has some ionic plates that will pull particulate matter out and have them adhere to that, and you have to take the plates out and clean them. Um, if you're doing a lot of scanning, you get a lot of dust, or you're in a problem area, I know at one time uh, my wife and I used to live in a house uh, path not too far down the way from the tracks, and every time a train came by, and it wasn't that frequently, but when they did, the dust would just pour through the house. Uh, if I was running a standing business at that point, I'd have to have uh, at least thin at the top end will usually pure 500. Can I use you and I, even for little desktop ones as well. Is this Omni Grid Mat? And what that does is we lay it down on the counter. This is where we actually scan from underneath an Omnipad. And what that will do is that allows us to have kind of a cushion base so I'm not putting them right on the tabletop or right on the desktop. It helps facilitate being able to pull pictures up a little bit. So this is a great little tool. They're not that expensive. You can get them different sizes. We happen to go for the 24 by 36 ones, but you can actually get little smaller ones if you like. Then there's these cleaning swabs. Now, these are not your Q-tips, your cotton tips, right? These are actually cleaning swabs that don't have, if you look at the tip here, that don't have that kind of cotton uh, um, component to it, but basically it has something that won't shed because that cotton can, can shed those little particles and cause more problems than not. A new tool that we just put in our box is this new motorized static charge cleaning brush. 
It's a cool little brush. It actually uh, has some LED lights around the edge of it. Uh, again, another way to help clean those small areas. And finally, whisk brush that's available. Um, probably you're going to find out real quick that uh, Rick likes brushes. And I really do because brushes will help bring the material out and away from the area where you're scanning and hopefully get it out of the uh, path of your, of your digitized images once they've been um, going through the process. Now, honorable mention for support classifications. There's a few here that we use and we have a lot of fun with them. The first is a loop. If you've never used a loop before, it's fantastic for finding out if you've got scratches on pictures, what's on them. Uh, we use the 10 times loop. You can get really sophisticated on them. We don't need them that much, but they're certainly a great tool to have in the box. They're very small and uh, very portable and take a look. The other is, um, and I've shown on this one a dual mode flashlight. We actually have two. We have a black light flashlight and then we have just a regular little flashlight so we can look for parts or something that we've dropped or things that we're looking for. Uh, the black light is if you ever want to see what's on pictures and you just can't understand why you're getting a certain look when you digitize a picture, you'd be surprised the types of organic materials that get sprayed on the pictures. So we'll turn the lights off and we'll scan it and say, oh, this is on the picture and this is why it picked it up. Something we don't use here but we are certainly familiar with it. We've used a, a different type of product. It's a photo emulsion cleaner, and they come with some pads. They're a little expensive, uh, a little goes a long ways, and this is actually an emulsion cleaner so that it's safe to spray onto the photos. One thing you always want to be careful about is that you don't get photos wet. Um, although they were processed and developed in solution and in, in, in fluids, um, they can cause staining, so be careful. You want to use something, if you feel like you have to get that clean, you want to use a, a authorized product, something developed specifically for it, like this emulsion cleaner. We don't do a lot of marking on any of our photos, but we like to keep these pins around because every once in a while we need to do something in organization. You spend a little bit more, but when you get this photo marking pen, you can be assured it won't bleed through on the back end in a couple of years, and you're preserving that picture as best you can if you're going to add something to the back of it. Another thing that we use in our toolbox is we've got this sewing tape measure. Now, why sewing tape measure? The reason why is it's cloth, it's easy to use, and it also helps us. So when we're doing a job and estimating a job, we pull that out and we can measure. We know there's about 100 pictures per inch, so we can pretty quick get an idea around about how many pictures we're dealing with in a certain container. And finally, this is the one I was telling you about just a little bit earlier. We use a commercial pan sheet cart. Now, I got this inspiration from a Krispy Kreme donut store, and I was sitting in line going through uh, the drive through and I saw them roll this out, and I said, wow, look at all how many donuts they can get on this thing. And we actually now use this. I've got two or three of them here. And we actually use it because you can stack your jobs. It's adjustable. We can get as many as 10 different jobs on here. And it's very portable. So if you're trying to conserve space, this is a great tool. So now let's go through our top 10. These are what we consider essential. And starting at number 10 is a box to put them in. Now, it's a support tool. And it's a storage box, and it's to store our stuff. And you can find them in craft and hobby shops. And you can spend as little as a 10 bucks or $15 on them, or all the way up to very intricate on the uh, $50 range. The box that we use happens to be a little bit more than 12 inches in size. The trays actually lift out in ours. This has a telescoping tray. It's a great way to keep everything in one place, or at least your essentials. And it's also a great thing to take on the go with you if you do events. Number nine. Number nine is an adhesive eraser tool that is acid-free, it's non-toxic. These things are two by two inches in size. And if you've ever handled pictures and you've got all this particulate matter on her, on them, what will happen is that particulate matter can actually get knocked off if you're transporting them through an auto feeder or handling them on a 
flatbed. So what we will do is we'll try to just knock off the adhesives or the big parts of it. You don't want to rub too, too hard on it, but this is a, uh, these are safe. We use them mostly for the backs because that's where you'll find most of the material if they've been put on there, like misplaced adhesives and this type of thing. Because they're two inches in size, we'll cut them in half and get a little bit more uh, use out of them. Find them in craft and hobby sh stores, and they're just about three to five bucks. The next category at number eight is our cutting tools. And we use a number of cutting tools because you don't have just one kind of cut that you need to make. The first is we use this X-Acto tool, this knife. We happen to use the number two blade on it. And that helps you get really defined areas to cut or to trim and this type of thing. We also then augment that with a set of box cutters of uh, different sizes. Let me remind you that if you're using your box cutters, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you always cut the box blade to, its sh to the next level, clip it off. You can do that with a pair of like little or pliers or just be careful. Don't let that thing I catch somebody in the back every once in a while hitting it on the counter and trying to break it. Use some implement that you can actually attach and break it under control so it doesn't go flying out. But then you'll always have a sharp tip. And finally, we use scissors uh, once in a while for trimming things. We use them a lot sometimes just because the way the clients will bring their stuff and how they'll bind it all up and we'll use it to extract it that way. There's different size blades. We kind of have settled on the 8-inch blade. and you'll spend 10 to 20 dollars on these items. Now, kind of moving along side the cutting part, we're going to talk about handling with spatulas and different kinds of tools as you're needing to extract, remove and deal with different kinds of photo situations as you're preparing your Im your uh, images for for scanning. And one of the things is I we do not have, let me just kind of for, for sake of clarity, we do not keep all of these different spatulas. And these are artist palette knives is what they really are. I just want to show you the wide variety of them. They can come from a number one, and they run all the way up to a number 20. We have settled on a number nine, a number 11, a number 15, and a number 20. And we get the most use out of number 20. And the reason why is it's long, it's flat, it's broad, you can pick them up. If you do move down into the lower numbers and the smaller blades, please be careful that you're not going to puncture the photograph or the object as you're trying to lift it up or handle it in that way. They can get kind of some of these, especially like a number four or five, they can get very sharp on the ends. And you, know, you don't want to start picking with a knife. So you wouldn't want to necessarily be picking with one of these smaller numbered spatulas. To that end, a few years ago, we started using a multi-purpose tool that Creative Memories has out. And this is a, a plastic tool that won't in, uh, or will give you the point, but won't impale the picture. So it does more of a, a nice little lift. And if you're looking for lift, we buy a set of sewing tweezers, uh, the kinds of tweezers that you might use if you were going to thread a sewing machine. Um, and we primarily get the whole set. Again, you can kind of use the pointed ones for a little bit of lifting if you want. Uh, we use the flat bladed one more than anything else. And we also use a piece of tape on it. We'll take a, we'll take a piece of uh, tape that we'll put on the metal. So we're not actually metal to photograph or metal to, to the object we're uh, handling but it's actually been padded. And that will allow us to pick it up and move it around or use it as we need to, but it keeps it safe as well. So all of these are to deal with photo removal and extraction, and there's a whole plethora of them available. I don't think you need a full set of spatulas, but you're certainly going to want to have a couple. Number six. At, uh, number six is where we really rely in our support role. In our support role, we want to label and keep everything straight and organized. The post-it notes from 3M, and again, please settle on, on the brand 
version of these are not that much more expensive. And these have a neutral pH to them. They're acid free and they'll keep your picture safe if you if that touches the emulsion part of your photographs. We also use the Avery acid free removable labels. We actually number all of our batches of work when they come in. Um, when we first started, we actually just put a serial set of numbers on each one of these 80 sets and just peeled them off and put them on the batches and the groups of things that we did. This way we can quickly remove them back and forth. Um, at this point, we actually now have them uh, manufactured in big rolls of the thousands, but um, this is how we got started. We still use these for one other reason. If you're in the photo scanning business for a little bit of time or um, you, you're scanning photos for others, you're going to come that is either one, a possible copyright violation if you copy it and digitize it, or number two, maybe not necessarily as appropriate as you might think. Um, every once in a while, the uh, photo mats would process images uh, of full frontal nudity and that type of thing, and they'd be buried in a set, and they get by the uh, folks that were actually processing them, and now they're in this pack of photos. The people are totally embarrassed when they see them. We actually have taken these mark these removable labels, and we put a little statement on there that says we were unable to scan, and we'll actually then put a marker right over the parts that might be inappropriate for folks under the age of 18 to take a look at. So that's an idea how we use our labels. The nice thing about these is that they are removable, so they can come off very easily, and you don't have that adhesive residue that is possibly left. So those are types of items that you will use to help you get organized. Number five is essential to us. It's, again, fighting the environment, and it's microfiber cloths and pads and towels. We use the extra large. We go at this, these are eight inches by eight inches. In fact, it's one of the giveaways. We've got a full pack of them. They're awesome. They can be, re, uh, they can be cleaned. Please don't wash them in detergent. You can put residual uh, particulate stuff in there, and you'll get a film and this type of thing on it. And so what you're going to want to do is, if you do, re if you do wash these out, wash them out, let the mirror dry, um, and just use um, warm water and run it through this way. The towels that we use, again, for keeping the work area clean, keeping everything as dust-free as we possibly can, these can be washed, and we do wash them frequently. And finally, something that we just have um, adopted a number of years ago and just simply love is these microfiber pads. Um, they're usually 12 inches or 14 inches in size. They have uh, microfiber uh, top to them, and this is where, as we're scanning, we actually lay the pictures down and handle them on top of our pad, our Omni pad, and it helps absolutely cut that dust environment down as you're handling them. So we love them. They've got a hard kind of backing to the back. When I say hard, it's a it's a heavy cloth type of thing, so they'll lay flat, and we just simply love them. We've got a three or four of them that we keep in our work area at all times. Number four is you got to fight that dust in a, duff, a couple of different ways. We've talked about how to brush it away, but we're going to now talk about how to blow it away. And there are a number of different ways to blow them. Number one is you'll notice there is no canned air on here. Never use canned air. And the reason why is it has a propellant in it that actually comes out as a particulate matter with the air as it rushes out of the can. Besides that, they can get very expensive. We invested, at, when we first got started, we invested in the Giotto bulbs, and you would just pump it. It's got a very directed nozzle. It works awesome, um, but it's a very small area to cover. We changed our whole world and our whole working environment when we went to the Datavac electric duster. There's another one that is the Hurricane, and we've since a augmented our uh, dusting tools with this by uh, by using this one it's more expensive but it runs on the battery and holds the same kind of high volume air so if you're going mobile and this type of thing it's perfect for that type of thing the electric duster part this one from Datavac you plug that thing in it's got a conical 
uh, direction for the air and it's got some micro tips on it as well with some different uh, attachments to them that will help you. We blow our area off where we're scanning. We actually, when, uh, almost every batch of work that we get, we take it to a different location in a different room and we blow it out. We don't want the dust to be circulating the room that we're actually scanning in. And then we'll blow the area out very frequently before we start as we're doing jobs and after we've started. So these are fantastic tools and have reduced the amount of dust tremendously. We actually will even, when we do slides, we'll, we'll blow the slides in the tray and the rings attached to them and we'll actually blow those and you'll get fantastic results from that as well. So you've got a couple of different ones. This one's going to run, the Hurricane's going to run about 100 bucks. The electric duster's going to run somewhere in the 60 to $70 range and if you need the bulb, to get started, that's about $15. So we're down to the last three. Um, these, the focus on number three, there's three components to this. They're all, again, on environment. So we we brushed things away with our microfiber cloth. We've blown things away. Now we're going to get down to the very, very fine little dust specks. And the way we deal with that is we're going to clean our path with some sort of dust remover and particulate remover. There's three of them that we recommend. One is the brilliantizer pads. If you've never used this tool, it is a fantastic tool. Um, it will, it's not only um, a dry process, it's also a wet process. The red ones have a, um, a cloth in them with a specific material that's anti-static and will help you to clear the fingerprints and the scratches and this type of thing on, let's say, for instance, like your platen on your, on your flatbed. Um, you can actually use this to keep that nice and clean. The black tool, step number two here, allows you to then dry it off. Now, these are fairly expensive. If you look at them, they come in packs of like 12. And so what we do is we actually buy a mini Ziploc bag and keep this inside after we've opened it up and it will stay good for, for hours as you're using it and you can then reuse it. This is for glass and so if you've got a scanner that uses a glass platen or has glass imaging elements, perfect for you. The roller cleaning pads and the transport cleaning sheets, a little different. If you look at any scanner that has an automated tool or automated path, you'll see that the, the actual pickup pads will have little grooves in them. If they don't have grooves, you need to replace the rollers. But if you've got grooves in them, that particulate matter can get caught up, just little bits of it, and then they'll deposit themselves on pictures afterwards. These pads are a deep cleaning pad, and then if you want to just keep it clean as you go along, this transport cleaning sheet has a tackiness to it, and you can actually run it through. You can use it many, many times. We actually run it up and down the eight and a half by 11 side. We run it the 11 side. Then we'll actually take our scissors and cut off the sides and turn it sideways and start running it the other way so we can get twice the life out of it. Number two, again, we're fighting the dust. But now we're going to deter the dust. And we're going to deter that and the fingerprints by putting on gloves. Now, there's all sorts of different photo handling gloves. And I will tell you this, that we have probably tried every version that is known to mankind. And if I haven't, I'm sure I will be trying it at some time in the future. There's the nitro gloves as well as the cotton gloves. Now, in the cotton version, these, those can come in like an omni size so that they fit, or you can get the ones we actually like and sell are the ones that are actually custom fitted. If not, you're going to wind up kind of like in these nitro gloves. You wind up with them not necessarily uh, fitting as well as you like. Um, again, you don't want, if you're getting these kinds of gloves, the, the uh, nitro type of gloves, you want them powder free. Now, they put powder in them to make them easier to get in and out of, and that's because your hands sweat inside of them. So for us, we don't actually use nitro gloves. We have them here, but I don't use them. We use the cotton ones. They're fitted. They have a little uh, wrist uh, elastic around them to help keep them um, from slipping down. And also, they have a little uh, uh, rubber tip type of things. Uh, for photo handling, that makes it real simple to pick something up, rubber gloves. 
Well, we've gotten down to number one. And I had to kind of pull out uh, some Shakespeare for this one to lead up to it from the play to King John, where he said, Ah, oh, Mary, now soul hath elbow room. It would not out windows nor at doors. And you go, what in the world is he talking about? Our number one tool is essential for organizing, and you're going to go, Rick, you built up to this. It's your workspace. And I will tell you that the more workspace you have, the better you're going to be organized, the better your workflow, but it also will control your environment. It will keep things organized for you as you work through them. And there's something about this that I wanted to share with you is that we use an adjustable one when we go mobile. We have built our counters all at 42 inches high, so we scan standing up. But you want to be able to have something that's long. These are ta This particular table is 104 inches long, so it's a little more than 8 feet. It gives you lots of room to spread out. It's a perfect type of thing to get your project organized. So that's our number one recommendation is to have the right table in the right, right workspace. So we told you quickly before about how we look at our tools and how they kind of break out. And we break them out in these three categories. And if you notice, our top 10 fit pretty much the, the rule of thumb of about 40% of them in handling and 40% of them environmental and another 20% for support. This is an overall view of all of them, the essentials versus significant ones. I will tell you, I am sure that your toolbox probably, if you've been in this business for a while, has something else in it besides what we're missing or uh, what we have. And we're missing that part, or maybe we didn't bring it into our area. But these are the ones that we consider significant and essential when we're doing our job. So let's take a quick look through where David and Troy are. So if you'll start in the lower left by Troy's foot, there's pointing to our donut tray. And we use the plastic uh, trays to it. We can, as I said, put about eight, ten jobs on this, depending on the size. They'll hold big crates. We have the big milk crate, our, our mailbox types of crates as well, the plastic containers. And we can put them, and everyone has their own. And there's, if you could see, there's numbers uh, on, on each one of these. He's reaching for our duster. So we keep our duster at hand at all times. Moving behind him, that on the table and it's kind of been imploded with all sorts of things. The post-it notes are on there. The roll of stickers are down on the table as well because they come in rolls. Along with uh, all of our different spatulas and knives and this type of thing all in our go kit. David's got some tape dispensers here. He's got his gloves on. We've got our OmniPad and we've got our microfiber pad. So that's what's in our box. Um, we're ready to hear from you and take any questions that you might have. All righty, Rick. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. My name is David here. Just want to encourage you again to send us those questions. And the good news is I do see a couple that are showing up, and I'll go ahead to begin to go through. Um, first up for you, Rick, is if you're just starting out, what do you recommend as a strategy in getting your toolbox set up? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I actually would probably start out with getting something to put them in. Uh, it doesn't have to be a box like the one we showed you, but it needs to be a place where all your tools are because there's nothing more than as you get tools and not know where they are. Oh, they're over in this drawer. They're up over here. We actually have them where we can pull them out and, and go. And that may be as simple as a cardboard box for you. But if I was starting, I'd get, I'd get the box. Um, I'd get gloves of course, and I'd get a blower, a dust blower, um, even if it was just a hand pump bulb so that you can uh, make sure that your area is clean and microfiber cloth. That's, those are the things you'd find. Yeah. All right. That was the minimum. Mm -hmm. well, very cool. So then uh, here's another question. It says, uh, what tool do you guys use the most? The blower. 
There's no doubt about it. Dust is your enemy no matter what you do when you're handling photos. Uh, particulate matter, the blower is the number one tool. We blow before, we blow as we're going through it, and we blow after the job. We blow our scanner off, whether it's a flatbed that we're using or, or the, um, uh, the uh, auto feed scanners. Um, we just find that to be so effective in controlling our environment and keeping uh, the highest quality when we're scanning. All right, and I have another question here. It says, what is your favorite archival photo box? Well, <laughs> um, there's a whole bunch of them out there. I will tell you the ones that the folks from apo.org have. Uh, it's just hard to beat that particular one. It comes in two sizes. It's an, it's an excellent tool. Um, you can go and, and find that as well as if you are interested, you can go and look at a listing for APO members and they can all help you get one. But that's the Association of Personal Photo Organizers. They've just done a bang up job in that box. Um, I will tell you one thing I wouldn't do. Um, the craft and hobby shops are, are notorious for putting together the boxes made in China that are going to be um, very easy to come apart, and uh, so you go down and you buy, you know, the five-dollar box um, at the local craft and hobby shop, and I can promise you the life of that's not going to last. Even though it may be lignin-free and acid-free and photo-safe, it's just not the construction is not going to hold up. All righty, I have another question here. It says, "Is there a brand of ionizer air purifier you may recommend?" One you can afford. Um, <laughs> there are all sorts of them. The first one we bought, we actually bought from Target in the home section. Um, I don't even know the name of it. I think it was a Panasonic. Um, it, it, the thing we look for for air purifiers is this. I was always looking for something that not only just pulled the air through and had the filter in it, but also had the ion plates. They're charged. So basically what happens is dust, dust gets attracted and sticks to things. There's actually a whole webinar we could do on the types of dust. There's sticky dust and dry dust, and there's a whole bunch of different kinds of things about dust itself. But if, if dust is floating in the air and it runs by this plate, it has a great um, attraction to that type of thing. So it actually piles up on there. You pull the plates out and you actually wash them off. You'll actually see gunk on them. It's, it's kind of amazing. Um, and of course, the bigger ones that you do, um, so, for instance, the ones we have now actually uh, heat and cool the air and filter it and, and do all that at the same time. So you can, you can go crazy on those filters. But a little tabletop one, just if you're working in, in a small room, will be perfect for you. It's a great way to fight the dust environment. All right. My next question here, it says, do you have any tools that make sure you can inventory the photos incoming and outgoing? We do, and that's actually one of the things we showed you on, on the label system. It's a labeling system that we uh, created. We actually have a, a, a workflow tool, and I guess that's a plug for next month. We're going to talk about workflows. But we actually have a tool that we plug them in. We can we actually enter them into the computer as a number, and we can track them through the system as they go through. We know where they are in stages as they go along. But we use these uh, removable stickers. now. We actually leave the stickers on there and tell the customer, hey, here's the deal. We actually do a controlled method of workflow, and this sticker means something to us. If you have any questions, problems, issues, or concerns, you can refer to this sticker. You can always remove it because it's one of these uh, acid-free, easily removable things that won't leave a residue. All right, and I see two questions here that are fairly similar with each other. It says, um, have you ever bought a tool that didn't live up to your expectations, or did you not <laughs> use it all after you bought it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I got this fancy dancy, I'm embarrassed to, to mention how much I paid for this super vacuum system that we were going to control the environment by sucking things and what I came to realize is that blowing them away is much better than trying to suck them in. Um, and so I have now a $150 vacuum portable. It's got a strap on it. I mean, you look like you're a ghostbuster with this thing, um, all in, a, in the same original bag underneath. 
The other one, not as expensive, but and why it's still in my toolbox, I don't know. We'll have to talk to the guys about it. David, you fix this part. We had we we bought fishing line. So before we figured out the dental floss thing, we actually bought fishing line. We I, I literally went down to Walmart and bought fishing line at the in the sports department. It's still in there. Um, it's still wrapped, I think, in the original wrapping because I realized once I got, I said, Lippert, you're an idiot for doing this. What are you thinking about doing? So, so that's it. I guess the other thing I bought one time is I bought a metal ruler. Um, not a good thing. Uh, metal scratches emulsion, and 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 uh, it didn't take me long to realize that it was bringing up scratches as we were kind of measuring things. So, those would be my three. I wish I'd never done it. No. All right. Now, you do mention um, blowing out dust instead. So there's a question here. It says, is it safe to blow around your scanner? Uh, I thought you should avoid that because you could cause dust to get inside your scanner. So we use this concentric method ology and it's very planned and organized the way we blow. We blow from the center out and we actually do blow, so we blow our photo scanners um, and we op the uh, open imaging element, we blow down inside of that as well. It will not hurt it as long as you're not using compressed air with the particulate matter that can actually leave a residue. So these are, this is volume air being blown out, this is room air being blown out at a high speed. And we start at the scanning area and we literally work in a circle all the way out and the guys will tell you that work here, I mean when I mean out, I mean like six feet one way and six feet the other to make sure that we've kind of cleared the area out. Then with our gloves and our microfiber cloths, we've kind of done the best we can. We've got our, our uh, HEPA filter going as well. So I, I, you know, we're, we're trying to control that environment everywhere we can. One thing you do not want to do is blow your pictures in the same area where you scan because all you're doing is just literally shoving dust from one end to the other. We take them to another area and blow them completely. Got it. All right. And next question here, it says, what a PVC free plastic archival box at Michael's. Um, is a cardboard or paper box better? So, <laughs> I would say to you this, it, 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 the, it, there are several parts to that question and we should have a webinar on this because it has to do a lot with, one, is this, is this a safe box? Yes or no, um, in 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 PVC and the odors and the types of things. Is it photo safe? Let's just so let's make the assumption that whatever material, plastic material you use, is photo safe. The question is the atmosphere in which you store it and the skin in the conditions. We have a tendency to move towards the heavily uh, constructed boxes that are in, 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 in fi with fiber, so they're the heavy fiber boxes, cardboard types of boxes. Um, that's been our preference, although if you're transporting pictures on a kind of a temporary basis or moving them and using them, I don't think you're going to hurt your pictures, um, but we have a tendency to go more towards the archival area. Take a look at Gaylord, take a look at University Products, you'll see kind of some different uh, options and they'll give you the pH of them, they'll give you some of the strengths. We actually, when we use boxes ourselves, we use the ones that have the, the metal enforced hinges on them as well. They stack neatly and, and they're, they're great for us. All right, another question here. It says, do you have any nightmare scanning stories to share? <laughs> uh, yeah, I got a ton of them. That could be a whole other webinar in itself. <laughs> I'll tell you very quickly about the one photo that uh, we scanned. A guy walked in, happened to be somebody that was uh, uh, famous in our area walked in, found us, and said, hey, I got this one picture. It's the only picture of, uh, uh, like it of the kind, of the person that's in it. Can you scan this? I said, sure, I'd love to scan it. And um, so we looked at it, and um, it was in a frame, in a glass frame, and, and I said, I'll have it for you in a couple days. We'll get it all scanned. And he wanted it to be revitalized. So we touched base with somebody that would revitalize it for him. And we were all set. We scanned it. And then I said, man, you know, if we could just get this thing off the glass, that would be way better. Uh, went to take it apart and literally ripped the emulsion off the picture. Um, now, there's a product called PhotoFlow. We were able to kind of 
store our, 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 our damage to it. Um, but it was one of those things that I will never, had I had my black light, I'd have seen that was organic material and how we had done it. I just didn't know at the time what to expect when I kind of just said, it looked like it was supposed to come apart. So I would say that one, and the only reason it was a nightmare is because I promised the guy I would do it and I was spent Thanksgiving here doing it because uh, he brought it in and he was going to come back and pick it up on Monday. And, so it kind of ruined my Thanksgiving weekend. So I'm not sure if it was a bad story or if it was just a bad time. But they added up to be something kind of nightmarish. Okay. Well, that seems to be all of the questions for now. And everyone, I just want to remind you that to take the post survey that's coming up. It's uh, really important because not only do you get to tell us how we did, but you have the opportunity to win one of three tools for your toolbox. Um, if you decide not to take the webinar post survey today, the good news is that it will be available tomorrow via an email you will receive, which will also include the link to view this recorded session. So wait too long, you may miss out on some of those prizes as we will be announcing three winners tomorrow afternoon, um, and those winners will also be reached out to via email. And so, Rick, I'll give it back to you, and thank you guys for those very awesome questions. Hey, everybody, thanks so much for coming. We hope you enjoy looking in our toolbox. In the questionnaire as you leave is a place for you to put other tools that we maybe forgot. Um, we put a place up on our blog uh, where we're going to keep this dialogue going and list the other tools that you might have brought. Whether you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us or jump on easyphotoscan.com or email us at info at easyphotoscan. Love to have the chance to be of service, and thanks so much for joining us today. Afternoon.